Let's lift our praises and sing. And I Tell him what you feel right now. Come on in your own way and heart and mind. I worship you, Lord. Maybe you've lived long enough and been a product of your own fear and failure that you've become desperate for, for forgiveness and peace. And that's where the presence of the Lord really comes in. It's hard to be desperate. when Paul said, I've learned to be full hungry, but most of us have not. When we're full, we're full, and when we're hungry, we're hungry. Paul said, I've learned to be full of the blessings of God and still hungry for more. Uh, and I, I, uh, we got to be desperate when the bills are paid, and uh, we got to be desperate when they're not paid. We just got to be desperate for them, and so what a beautiful, if we could just sing that song driving down the road, don't close your eyes when you're driving down the road, but if you could just sing that song driving down the road, it would make a difference. Thank you for being here tonight. I, we get momentum on Wednesday night, and then my job carries me away, and I have to miss, and, and when the cat's away, the mice will play, and so sometimes you get disheartened when the pastor's not around. I, I appreciate that, but I appreciate you being here tonight, and we get... we. We were just building a big Wednesday night crowd, and then I had to be gone some, and I apologize for that. So, But I want a Bible study tonight, and I don't get into to the depth of it a whole lot because we have so many new folks and folks just hungry for a word and desperate for hope and help. And we're talking about help, uh, hope just a little bit before church. The Scripture says that hope deferred makes your heart sick. In other words, if you hope for something, and that don't happen. That's sickening. Anybody know? Everybody, you've been there, haven't you? It's just, it's just so overwhelming. And so, but on the other hand, if you don't have hope, hope's what drives us. Hope's what pushes us. We're all hoping. Everybody in here has a hope, a wish, a hope that they they, they pray happens, that comes true. How many of you are hoping for something? And that hope drives you, keeps you putting one foot in front of the other. But if that hope doesn't happen, then that's a sickening thing. And so we, people say, well, I'm trying not to hope too much, but my goodness, we better hope some. And, 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 but I, there are some hopes. There are some, I'm, I'm hoping for a better day. I'm hoping for a place called glory. And those are promises that I can hang my hope to uh, that are yea and amen, and they'll happen. And so my hope, the Scripture said, is in the Lord. And when you put your hope in the Lord, then he won't disappoint you. Because his promises are, the scripture says, yea and amen. And so that means his promises are true and they will happen. I want to talk to you about Pentecost. What is Pentecost? Where did that word come from? And uh, it's important. Uh we don't hear too much about it. We, we hear about Pentecostal churches, and, and we hear about Pentecostal doctrines, and we hear about Pentecostal people, and in some, in some places that's a good word, in some places that's a bad word, but where did the word come from? And I just thought I would just talk about Pentecost being important for a while because it's really important. And, and where did it come from in the Old Testament? How do we relate it to the New Testament? So I want you to kind of get your Bibles out, and we'll do some slicing and dicing here for just a few minutes. We're not going to spend a long time, but just talking about some stuff that I think you need to know. You know, you, know, you, you come to church, and you need to, you need to feel something. You need to get an answer for a question. But we need to learn some things, too. I mean, too many people sit on church pews and really don't know enough about the Word of God. You may know a lot about your job. You may know, but we need to know a lot about the Word of God. We have a working knowledge of the Word of God. So somebody came up and said, what's Pentecost? What would your answer be? 
well, honey, I am fixing to give you an answer. If you tell them all this stuff, then they're going to like, wow, this is one smart dude. So let's dig into this. Acts chapter 2, my favorite chapter in the Bible. I'll read out of it more than any other chapter. When the day of Pentecost, anybody know what P-E-N-T-E means? How about the lawyer in the house? Tell me what that means, 50. Okay, everybody say 50. What's the importance of 50? We'll get there in a minute. When the day of 50, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire or divided tongues in the New King James, and it sat upon each of them. And what happened? And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit or the gift of the Holy Ghost. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. Boy, now there's an odd sentence. I mean, there's there, that's an odd sentence. That's a non and most denominations would never read that verse in church. And they and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance or the ability. So that's, if you ask people about Pentecost, yes, most Christians are about Pentecost that have got a good, decent knowledge of the Bible, that's where they're going to go is Acts chapter 2. And they're going to say that the church started. Every denomination, every theologian, if you ask them, where did the church start? They're going to say this is the church started on the day of Pentecost. But where did that come from? So let's talk about it a little bit. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you for being here again. <clears throat> now, I'll prove this to you in some scriptures, but where... Pentecost was an Old Testament celebration. Now, Leviticus chapter 23, I would imagine when uh, you read your Bible that Leviticus is not the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, you ought to hear Brother Jack pronounce Leviticus. You've heard him do, say Deuteronomy and you had no idea what he was saying. And the only reason I did is because I asked him. But Leviticus, have you found it yet? If you have your Bible or punched it into your phone, it would be good to get there. By the way, if you have a, 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 a smartphone and you don't have a Bible app on that, you should do that. There's so much stuff on my phone. It w I've got a library of Bible books on my phone. I can do more studying on my phone in 30 minutes than I used to could do in three or four hours of digging through books. I can just punch it. I can search for a word, and boom, there it is. Amazing. I, 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 I've written a lot of sermons using my phone as reference material. Now, if you'd have said that 20 years ago or 10 years ago, people would have thought you're crazy. But I've got more, no, I've got several Bible apps on my on my phone and several study uh uh, applications on my phone. I just punch a button, and it's amazing stuff. And so uh, I used to really bother me when I'd say, let's all get our Bibles, and people start grabbing their telephones. So, uh, But you need to, I think we need to understand how these books line up and where to find stuff. But, boy, there's a lot of material. You can learn a lot if you download some of this stuff on your phone. And so I'd be glad to share some of that with you if you're interested in that. But Pentecost was a Jewish celebration. This day of Pentecost, what's happening is there people had gathered from around the world, around the known world. The Jews from around the world were coming back home to the motherland to celebrate a Jewish feast. The feast was called Pentecost. In Leviticus chapter number 23, if you have that in front of you, we're just going to read one verse in a minute, but the whole chapter is about the feast of the Lord. Okay. There were several feasts that, if you were a Hebrew, if you were, a, you had feasts that you celebrated throughout the year, and the book of Leviticus talks about those feasts and are fascinating feasts. Not only does it talk about those feasts, it tells you when you should have those feasts, what day of the year you should have those feasts. Well, and each one of those feasts commemorated something. Most of them had something to do with Moses and the, the coming out of Egypt and coming into the promised land. Most of those feasts were some celebration of some event, 
that happened in that 40-year span. Just to jump ahead and say the Feast of Pentecost was uh, the observance of God giving the Ten Commandments to Moses on Mount Sinai. And what, did, what, does, what is the significance of Pente, of 50? It was 50 days after they left Egypt. Remember, they were in bondage in Egypt for 400 years. How many of you remember that in Sunday school? And Moses pointed his finger at Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And then you had all the plagues. Y'all remember that? How many of you remember that? Okay, and they had all these plagues. And finally, Pharaoh said, okay, I'll let, I'll let you go. And so they left Egypt. And remember the night before, that's another feast. It's called Passover. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay? Pentecost is 50 days after Passover. Passover was the feast they had the night before they left Egypt, remember? When I see the blood, the death angel came. When I see the blood, I'll pay, are you with me? We can spend a lot of time reading through these scriptures, but I've got some more stuff I want to talk about. But if you were to go in Leviticus chapter 23, it's a feast that celebrates the history of Israel. All of these feasts, you have the the, 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 the Sabbath. It talks about the Sabbath in the first few verses. Then it talks about Passover which was the great feast of the Lord. Then it talks about the feast of unleavened bread. And it talks about the feast of first fruits. And then it talks about the feast of Pentecost. Then it talks about the feast of trumpets. And then it talks about the day of atonement. And then it talks about the feast of tabernacles. I don't know, and I, what I don't know, I don't know, and so you can ask me about this, and my answer is I don't know, but what I think is when that final trumpet blows and God catches away his bride, I think that's going to happen on the Feast of Trumpets. When the trumpet sounds, well, what does the trumpet sound? You can go back and find the trumpet sounded when they blew the trumpets was at the Feast of Trumpets, and that was in our... Uh, well, we won't talk about the, the time because those, but I believe that that is a great thing to study about. But you've got the, let's go over those feasts again. You've got the Sabbath, the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Red, the First Fruits. Sabbath was celebrated every week. Uh, Passover once a year, Unleavened Bread once a year, First Fruits once a year, Pentecost once a year, Feast of Trumpets once a year, the Day of Atonement once a year. And the Feast of Tabernacles was also celebrated once a year. And those are the feasts of the Lord that are celebrated on an annual basis by the Hebrew people. Every one of those feasts, if we were to take the next seven Wednesday nights, every one of those feasts has major significance in the New Testament. And we may do that. I'd have to do a lot of cramming to be able to do that. But over the next seven weeks, maybe we should do that. But the Feast of Pentecost is a Jewish tradition that takes place 50 days after Passover or 50 days after Exodus. And what happened 50 days after Passover was Moses went into the mountain and he received the Ten Commandments when God took his finger, the finger of God written on tables of stone, and, and Moses saw the glory of the Lord. That is where Pentecost or 50 comes from. What happened the night of Exodus? Passover. That was a feast where they slew the lamb. They put the blood on the door doorpost. Now, let's bring that to the New Testament. And you can do a little homework on this. Um, anybody know what happened of significance in the New Testament at Passover? Come on, somebody. On Friday night, they crucified the Lord. Calvary. When I see the blood, what was the lamb's blood in the Old Testament? Remember the significance? What was the significance of Passover? What was it? What's the New Testament? They put the blood on the doorpost of their house. They had no idea why they were doing or what they were doing. They were just blindly obeying a command. But who else's blood was shed on that same day of the year? The blood of Jesus was shed on Passover. And when that blood is applied to our, when the Lord sees the blood, he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now I got come on to the promised land. So you have what the Passover, Jesus was crucified 
on Passover. Anybody know what happened 50 days after Passover or 50 days after the, 40 days after the crucifixion? Okay, remember Jesus rose from the dead and he walked among them for 40 days, remember that? And then he ascended into heaven. Okay, 10 days after he ascended into heaven, that would be 50 days after Passover, the Feast of Pentecost, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and they all were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That happened the same time that Moses was walking down from the mountain with tables of stone. Because Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but I came to fulfill the law. God wrote on tables of stone with his finger, and here comes Jesus in flesh. And he fulfilled the law. Aren't you thankful for that? And that's what the mercy is in the body and blood of Jesus Christ. You're not going to find mercy anywhere else. The blood on the doorpost was the mercy of God. I mean, it was a type. The Old Testament was types and shadows of things that were to happen in the New Testament. You can absolutely know for sure that there wouldn't be a gospel if there wasn't a Pentecost. You can absolutely know. I don't know. You can argue a thousand different ways, but there is no arguing the fact that there wouldn't be a church, there wouldn't be a bride, there wouldn't be forgiveness, there wouldn't be any of those things would not be available to us without Pentecost. You could also say that they wouldn't be available without Passover. When you say Passover, you can say Passover and crucifixion, and you mean the same thing. Passover in the Old Testament is crucifixion in the New Testament. The giving of the law in the Old Testament at Pentecost was the fulfilling of the law on the day of Pentecost in the New Testament. You see how this works together? Isn't it amazing that the day of Pe Jesus was crucified on Passover and on the day of Pentecost the Holy Ghost fell? And somebody in here, several somebodies in here did not know that. And when you start put, you just can't deny that the Bible is the Word of God, that God's had this planned out. Are you with me? So, again, let me go over it again. You have Exodus you have the Passover, the Exodus from bondage, 400 years of bondage in Egypt, some 3 million Hebrews walking out of the greatest nation in the world, going into a desert for 40 years. You have Moses leading them out of, you have the Red Sea, you have the Egyptian army being destroyed in the Red Sea. And, you know, we could talk about baptism a while there, but you could that happened when that night they walked out of, that morning they walked out of Egypt, 50 days after that, Moses in the mountain getting the law. On that same day, Jesus was crucified. Fifty days after he was crucified, the Holy Ghost fell on the day of Pentecost. So you got that. Forty days after he was crucified, he ascended into heaven. Ten days after that, the Holy Ghost fell. They tarried in Jerusalem. Remember in Acts chapter 1, go tarry until you be endued with power from on high? That's a ten-day period. So... That's pretty exciting to know that. I, to me, I, I like it. You may think that's the most boring stuff you ever heard, but I love that stuff because it makes me know that the word that I read and the Bible I believe in, it really does fit together. So, so can, I, can I get an amen if this is true, if you agree with me, that Pentecost is important in both Testaments? So come on, folks, let's quit taking Pentecost out of the church. Let's just, in the Greek, they called Pentecost the Feast of Weeks. Another proof of how the time went. Let's go to Levit Leviticus 23 and 15. And ye shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath. Seven Sabbaths in one day. Okay, you can count for yourself for, from the day after. The, you got to read Leviticus 23. Homework tonight before you go to bed. Sleep real good. Read Leviticus 23 right before you go to sleep. Go sleep like a baby. 
And you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. The wave offering was the feast of first fruits, which celebrated, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm, I'm about to have a runaway here. Who was God's tithe? Jesus was God's tithe. G God sacrificed his firstborn son, hoping that he'd have nine more in the world that we live in. And so, and, and so he said, after you, uh, you count seven weeks, seven Sabbaths plus one day, that's 50 days. So that's a wonderful chapter for you to read. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse number nine. I wish I'd have had him go nine through. Everybody say Deuteronomy. And you go home tonight or you tell somebody at, at break time tomorrow, my pastor preached out of Leviticus and Deuteronomy last night. I said, boy, you slept good in church. Leviticus chapter number 16 and verse number 9. And, Tim, if you can put it up there, we'll go down through verse number 12 because I like it all. Can you do that for me real fast? You shall sign, Kevin, week, seven weeks for yourself. Begin to count the seven weeks from the time you begun to put the sickle to the grain. Then you shall keep the Feast of Weeks to the Lord your God with the tribute of a freewill offering from your hand, which you shall give as the Lord your God blesses you. You shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant, your female servant. This was just a big party. It's a day off for everybody. There's nobody working today. Your kids don't have to do the chores. Your servants don't have to go to work. The banks are closed. Sonic's not even open. Okay. The Levite who is within your gate, the stranger and the fatherless, everybody, the widow who are among you, you're going to have a celebration. It don't matter what your station in life, we're going to have a party at the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. Where's that? That's Jerusalem. We're going to go to Jerusalem and we're going to have a party. That's why they were there. Okay. And you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt. How many of you are thankful that you're not a slave to the devil anymore? And you shall be careful to observe these statutes. You shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days, which you have gathered from your threshing floor and from your wine press. And you shall rejoice in your feasts, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, a Levi, and a stranger, and a father, and a widow who are within your gates. They had seven parties every year. And we just have Memorial Day, Labor Day, and Halloween. New Year's. Christmas and Thanksgiving. That's six. We're a couple, we're one short. Easter. But you ought to read about those and study those a little bit. And you'll you'll see. They'll make a lot of sense. And if you want to know where they relate in the Old Testament, uh, then we can talk about it. A couple things more I want to talk about before we leave concerning Pentecost. Uh, what happened on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2? Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. But what happened right before that? Or right after that, excuse me. There appeared unto them divided tongues or cloven tongues like as with fire, little tongues of fire, visible little pieces of fire set upon every one of them. So you got two things happening. You got wind and you got fire on the day of Pentecost. And those are both representative of the Spirit of the Lord. And so let's just give you a couple of Old Testament references. Job chapter 12 and verse number 10 and I've just put, we could really dig into the weeds here and really bore you to death. I just want to hit the high points and maybe urge you to go home and research some of this stuff. Who among all those does not know that the hand of the Lord, verse 10, I gave you now that has done this, in whose hand is the life of every living thing, okay, 
He, in his hand is the life of everything, but it's the breath of mankind. He didn't say it's the breath of everything. He didn't breathe into anything except that. He said in his hand is the life. Everything lives in his hand. He has the whole world in his hand. He has a little bit. Of, he has everything in his hand. But he breathed the breath of life into Adam, and he became a living soul. You understand the difference? He has the animals and the plants in his hand, but he breathed into mankind. Well, I don't know if I believe that or yet. Or, well, you're fixing to, so hang on. In whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? Remember, he created everything, but he never breathed on it. But he made Adam out of the dust of ground, and he breathed into Adam, and he became a living soul. No one, nothing else had a soul. Everything else was just existing in his hand. But Adam became a living soul. John chapter 3 and verse number 8. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. What happened when Adam sinned? The Bible said when you, the day you sin, Adam, you're going to die. The breath of God was removed from Adam, and Adam began to age. Adam hadn't aged a second. Adam didn't even live in time. Adam lived in eternity when he sinned. But the second he sinned, he began to age. We all are a product, of, a product of Adam's sin. That's why we fight time all the time. That's why we, we age. That's why Alan's hair is thinner than it was when he first came to church here. That's why AJ shaves his head. That's why I got this bald spot just driving me crazy that Kayla makes fun of all the time. She walked in there with Brother Willie. She said, hey, bend over. I'm going to see that bald spot. Get out of here. Age did that to me. Adam didn't have to fight age until he sinned. But when he sinned, he began to fight age. The breath of God was removed from him. And so the breath of God was pent up. You never find God breathing on anybody ever again in the Scripture until the day of Pentecost was fully come. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing, mighty wind. That was God holding his breath for 4,000 years. Think about it. 4,000 years, God had been wanting to breathe on his creation again. His breath had been removed from Adam, and Adam was dying. And when God starts breathing on us, if this same spirit dwells in you that dwelled in Christ, then we're going to live forever with him. It's the thing that's going to get us out of here. It's the breath of God that's going to get us back into eternity. When God breathed into Adam. He breathed into his creation again on the day of Pentecost. And somebody needs to say amen. And those that receive his spirit, they can live forever again. They can go out of time and back into eternity. And unless the Spirit of God's breathed on you, you're not going to live forever in heaven. I want to be breathed on by the Spirit. I want God to kneel over me and breathe on me, don't you? I need it. I need it. The first Adam received the breath of life, and the second Adam breathed the breath of life back into us. And so I'm excited about that. John chapter 3, verse 8, if you'll put it up there again. I want to just read that last sentence. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. The Old Testament and the New Testament. Fire is representative of the Spirit of God. Tongues like as a fire set it on each of them. Our God is a consuming fire. Take a coal from the altar, Jeremiah said, and put it on my tongue, and it became in him like fire shut up in his bones. God give us wind. Give us fire. Don't let us just be a dull, dry, boring place that you come and sit for an hour so you don't have to feel guilty for the rest of the week. But let the Spirit breathe life. Let there be fire. Let Pentecost become important again.
place we call church. If Pentecost is not important, my thoughts are for your consideration, if Pentecost is not important, then it's not a church. Because if God's not breathing and God's not burning, then why in the world would you want to be there? What you start doing over time is you start gossiping about each other. You start consuming each other, and it becomes a cesspool of everything that we say we don't believe in. But when God's burning the chafe away, when the Spirit of God's breathing and he's burning up the impurities and we're repenting of our sin and God's burning those things out of our life and purging us and then the breath of the Lord's breathing into us, and there's, there's a celebration there. Our Sunday services are celebrations, folks. If you hadn't been here on Sunday in a while, they're just celebrations. You don't walk out here saying that was bad. You walk out here saying, yeehaw, that was good stuff. Except Jones, he don't say yeehaw. <laughs> but that was good stuff. You walk because there's a celebration of, but it needs to be more than that. It needs to be, the celebration needs to be so compelling that the servant and the daughter and the son and the mom and the dad and, the, and it needs to be so compelling that people are drawn to it. On the day of Pentecost, when they what happened on the day of Pentecost when they were having this party, this celebration in the upper room, they drew a crowd of thousands. The party was so raucous that people just started saying, "Hey, this is some wine I don't know about." Let me just tell you, you could read it and you can read between the lines, but what these feasts became is just like holidays in America have become. They became seven drunks that they celebrated through the year. That's what they were. Everybody came and they drank wine. And when they heard all these folks, they thought, is this some new kind of wine? Peter said, well, sort of. They're not drunk like you think they're drunk. He didn't say they weren't drunk. He said they're just not drunk the way you think they're drunk. But this is a drunk that the prophet uh, prophesied about in Joel chapter 2 and verse number 28 that in the last day saith God I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh then you can only have so many drunken parties for you need something else and they said we want some of that new wine and that day 3,000 more people besides the 120 people the party was so awesome that 3,000 people joined that party that day and 3,120 people that evening were believers in the body and the blood, the breath and the fire of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pentecost is important. So let's celebrate it every Sunday. Let's celebrate it. Every Sabbath, let's celebrate it. Sabbath is really Saturday, but every time we come to church, let's celebrate Pentecost. What's wrong with that? Any comments, questions, misunderstandings? Did I make a believer out of you? We could have dug into it some more, but let's, that gives you some homework. And let's, let's go find out if the preacher's really telling us the truth. And let's put all these pieces together. And let's, when we come to church Sunday, let's not, let's celebrate with an intent. Amen. You know, we used to sit in church, me and my brother, and, and, it, my brother was always the bad when it was never me, but we'd sit in church, and, and uh, all of a sudden, one of us would just go. And then the other one would do it, fake a yawn. And you watch, it wouldn't be five minutes, everybody in church yawned. Yawning is contagious. But what's really contagious is the breath and the fire of God. Now, do you want to have a church where everybody's yawning? Or do you want to have a church that's full of the wind and the fire of the presence of God? That's the kind of church I want to go to. And so I want to come to church with an expectation. I want to raise my level of expectation to the point that I think the lid's going to come off this thing. And that those parties that they were having. They couldn't get buildings big enough. They started having them on Solomon's porch where thousands of people would gather in front of the tabernacle. They couldn't have a building big enough to get everybody in. The father of Methodism, somebody help me with his name, but just John Wesley.
one of the greatest preachers. He was Holy Ghost filled from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And the more I read about, I can read about John Wesley, and I just get goosebumps reading about him. They couldn't find buildings big enough. He couldn't, and he came to America to do revival. He he was from England. He came to America to preach revivals, and they just they put him in a building, and it would just become people were getting injured, and so he would just go out in a pasture somewhere, literally out in a field somewhere. And they said John Wesley's in the Whitley's pasture down on Nares Road, and thousands of people would show up. Thousands of people would show up, and they interviewed him. Uh, the New York newspaper interviewed, or Pennsylvania newspaper interview, interviewed him and said, Mr. Wesley, what is it? And I, I said this on Sunday a few weeks ago. What is it that that people would come from, uh, they would walk for days and gather out in the elements just to, to hear you preach? He said, I just set myself on fire, and they come to watch me burn. Woo! That's a party. So let's come to church Sunday morning and let's just have church. Let's have some new wine, some fire, and some wind. And those people that are looking for a party, they'll find it here. And they'll find something that will give them life everlasting. Church ought to be exciting. Church ought to be refreshing. Church ought to be new, different. And it shouldn't be boring. It shouldn't be a place you get talked about and ate up and devoured and wounded in the house of your friends. It shouldn't be any of that. It should be a place of love and understanding, mercy, forgiveness. You man here ever made a really bad mistake? You ever needed forgiveness? Let's just be that place. God will bless us for it. I'm glad to be here. I hope you're glad you came. Let's stand together. Leviticus chapter 23. Everybody say that. Everybody say Leviticus chapter 23. Good. I don't even know who. It's not Letterman anymore. I don't even know who does late night. But instead of turning on the TV, why don't you read Leviticus chapter 23? You'll fall asleep a lot faster. And you'll be glad you did. Lord, I love you and I thank you for your word. It's so rich and it's so real and it's so, it fits together so perfectly. And we thank you for it. We thank you for the ministering spirit, the spirit of, of, of confirmation that we feel in this house right now. And we, we thank you for these faithful, wonderful people that are here tonight. We pray that you'd anoint them with a hunger, with a thirst, with a, an excitement and anticipation and expectation of great things in the spirit and though we fight hard battles we can all come together for a celebration every man every woman every servant every boy every girl every person that just got out of jail or every situation every race every creed every we can come together and we can have a celebration of your presence you can fill us with your spirit let that happen in this place and let it happen uh, every time we come together just fill us with anticipation and expectation and hope. And somebody said in Jesus' name, amen. Could we just give the Lord a hand clap of praise this evening? Thank the Lord.